Everybody, what's up? What's up? What's up? What's up? Thank you for joining us again. You're listening to the Dose of the Ghost podcast, sir. And Jay and I today, we decided. Well, I decided actually to go out to Five and Below, Five Below, baby, and get us uh, some <laughs> some. Uh, what are these even called? Arms of strength. Arms of strength. <laughs> Three arms of strength. We're, we're tr- this is what we're trying to do. We're trying to video this thing, and I failed miserably the last three episodes. We're three episodes deep, actually four today, and uh, we've been trying to videotape with. I have like this high end camera, mm-hmm. and it's just a boring shot, and it's just, it's just, I'm not inspired by it at all. So I'm like, you know what? I have the brilliant idea of going and getting these five dollar three scorpion arms, three scorpion, scorpion tails <laughs> <laughs> that hold our iPhones and. Uh, yeah, so hopefully this will work. We got a three camera Boom. triangular uh, solution <laughs> here we're working with, but man, we're just trying to make it do what it do, yes, sir. Uh, so that's why we need your support, y'all. So hit us up on Patreon, Patreon. and uh, we we sure would love that. So, dude, okay. So every every episode, I, I feel like we have a rhythm right now, Jay. Mm-hmm. We're, we're like, okay. We're kind of saying what's up, Jay, right off the top. Yeah, and um, I think it's 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 a, it's a meant to be thing because yeah. <laughs> it's, it's been working. <laughs> because for, if this is your first time listening to this podcast, we we talk about the Holy Spirit. We talk about um, what it, the the premise of it is. I, I get with people who have pretty incredible stories, and I ask them, "When did you encounter the Holy Spirit?" and "How has the Holy Spirit influenced you in what you do day to day now?" So it's really cool and interesting, but. Somehow, it, when have, having Jay special on special so, segment, special <laughs> segment, right? It was like, "What's up, Jay?" And so slowly, he's been like, "Oh, everybody's listening to me. Everybody's watching me. I better yeah. get my my stuff get together. My together, man." <laughs> so what I like to do is he doesn't even know this right now, but I put together a special episode, Uh-oh. a little song <laughs> I put together um, that's just called go. uh, "What's Going On, Jay." So we're gonna start the uh, this fourth episode with a brand new um, <laughs> debut of our first uh, uh, session of the podcast, uh, What's Going On, Jay? Uh-oh. What's going on, Jay? Yeah. <laughs> Have you stepped into your purpose? That's <laughs> tight. What's going on, oh, that's Jay? Awesome. That's awesome. Tell me what's up, cosmic worship. Yeah. Hey, man, that's tight. <laughs> 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 that is tight, dude. You know how much fun I had making that. That is tight. But I was like, is it is it too much though? <laughs> <Like> it's tight. <laughs> I've done it before for my brother and my wife. I made them ringtones and they oh, had to do them. Dude, it's, it's so like tight. pick up the phone, ring, 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 ring. <laughs> <laughs> so, dude, tell us what's going on, man. Okay, what's man. Up? I'm. I, I wrote four, ha- four halves of songs, uh, all in one in in like. Two hours, like Dang. one day. Like I, I just was like, all right. I sat in my music room on the side of my Dragon Ball Z and Power Ranger toys on one side, studio mm-hmm. on the other. And I said, I'm going to focus on writing songs. And I was just playing instrumentals, kind of how we do in the settings when we're all together, just playing some beats and creating some music. And I'm just like, okay, I'm just going to figure some stuff out. I started writing some stuff down. So I'm like four halves in. Okay, hold up a sec, though, because people don't know you all that much, and you said Dragon Ball Z and then Dragon something Ball else. Z and Power so Rangers. let's just go ahead and, and you have an addiction or something's going on. <laughs> I think it was the so, day you, you told me, um, when you first told me, uh, yeah, I'm going to a conference. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, what? You got? And you're like, I got to get dressed up. I got. Yep. And I was like, what? I'm all in. Dragon Ball so, Z. Dragon Ball Z. Dragon Ball Z. That's something I'll never let go until I'm a thousand years old. <laughs> I will go to the Kamen High Cons. I will dress up. I will yeah. collect the toys and Power Rangers. Dragon Ball Z and Mighty Morphin Power Rangers. Anything after 95 Power Rangers, I don't even want it. Wow. Wow. <laughs> it's not the real deal. So you're recording music, or not recording music, you're just writing songs right now. But you did mm-hmm. record a video mm-hmm. like a couple weeks ago because we were uh, had a podcast with Larry Titus mm-hmm. and you said, yeah, I'm going to record a, a video tomorrow morning. And I think I saw something oh, on the music video. Oh, yeah. yeah. So I'm, I almost forgot. How'd that so, happen? So basically a guy from UTA, 
Uh, not ETA. What's the school in Arlington? Is that ETA? Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah. Okay. Because the initials say Arlington. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> Is that an Austin? Uh, so he he said he had to either do a small film for his class or a music video, and he was like, "Hey, do you want a music video?" I'm like, "Yeah, don't really need one right now because as you guys mm-hmm. know, I'm writing mm-hmm. right now." Mm-hmm. But I said I'm going to go back and take a few of those songs I never really got out there, and I'm revamping revamping them. So I got a guy reconstructing the piano part, and I'm going to redo the vocals. Please nice, help dude. me with that, Brandon. <laughs> yeah, and um, gonna and um, so we shot the video and it it was awesome. The, the, they were like, "You don't even need to redo it." I'm like, "If you know how copywriting works, I gotta redo it." <laughs> but it, the video is nice. It's kind of basically, it's kind of it's, it's called "Turn Me Around" because God turned my life around, and then the situation when I lost my dad turned my life around. Mm-hmm. So it's kind of uh, ode to my father's, and it it's it's dope, man. We got like actors like they're. they're like basically, I'm in the video. I want to give it a little bit away to tease. So basically, I'm chasing my memories of my dad and me. So they're like walking, in and I'm like staring at the memory. And there's scenes where I'm r- running up to it, and then they're gone. This is involved, yeah. Man. Like it's it's. Wow. I like everything Sweet. to be super deep. So that's very cool, I, very cool. Stuff. So yeah. we're we're gonna be looking out for that, dude. Sir, Hopefully I'm, not I'm in two thousand uh, twenty 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 eight. 20, 20. We're coming. <laughs> So, okay. So, man, I'm excited about today's podcast yes, because um, when I thought about, okay, maybe like the first five to 10 people I'd, I'd like to have on this podcast that have incredible stories, this was one of the first guys that I thought of because mm-hmm. I was like, okay, we talk, we talk about our stories having like some significance and some depth and some, you know, you know, struggle. But when you talk about this guy, you're like, uh, we're just going to shut up and listen. Yeah, baby milk. <laughs> we're baby milk. We are baby milk, dude. <laughs> but uh, part part of what I want this podcast to do is is basically just conversations with Christians. They can be artists. They can be uh, just leaders, friends, pastors, whatever. But you know, how has the Holy Spirit radically altered their journey, and and how can we gather that information to awaken? You know, how can we apply that to us? Mm-hmm. Because. Um, you know, Bible says that uh, they overcame him, but the enemy by the by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. Right. And I think that if if sometimes people they just don't want to listen to a bunch of Bible scriptures and this and that, but if they can listen to a story, they'll remember it and it sticks. So I'm excited to have this guy, his story. I've known him for a little bit. We have a little bit of history together, a tiny bit that kind of our our paths has crossed back and forth. But uh, he's a friend, a uh, 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 son of Larry Titus, also. If you listen to the podcast, this last uh, third podcast, go back and listen to that. We talked a lot about um, the Father, yeah. the Father, the Spirit of the Father, and uh, and and being adopted into God's family. Well, this guy is is very close and dear to Pastor Larry Titus as well. I'm excited to have him. So, uh, podcast listeners out there, turn your uh, turn your radios up. <laughs> <laughs> Just, uh, turn just. Dial in, focus Dial in, in, stop what you're doing, and, and concentrate because this guy is going to share a wealth of information and experience that you're going to not want to miss. So, ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together out there for Gene Megwire. Yeah, 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 yeah. Gene. What's up, brother? Man, you guys are awesome, man. I'm, I can just say amen now, and let's just, that's it. You know, you guys, you guys are so full of joy and, and so full of life. And Brandon and Jay, thanks, man, for inviting me and uh, be part of this. Uh, I was that's looking it. forward to it. In fact, on the on the way up here, I, I uh, a buddy of mine called me from prison in Pennsylvania. He's a lifer, and uh, I said, I said, Warner. Pray for me. I said, I'm going to do this podcast with Brandon. I was trying to explain mm-hmm. a little bit, and mm-hmm. he, he, I'm driving up, and he's praying, and we have 15 minutes on the phone before they click us off. You know, I said, keep praying, man. Wow. <laughs> so it was, it was awesome, man. So I'm, I'm so glad to be here. So, so awesome. glad to be here. That's incredible, bro. So we have video, so I'm going to put this up right here. This is a book, an amazing book by, uh, called Unshackled. He wrote this book, and he's going to share... Uh, I'm going to let him just rip it here in just a second. But, man, you got a forward by Greg Laurie. Yes. Holy yeah. cow. This this guy yeah. this guy has a story that even Greg Laurie is backing. So this is impre- incredible. So I, I just want to be quiet for a second. I want to give you, you know, 10 minutes or so just to set up your story. I'm sure you've shared it a lot. You have been going, yeah. uh, traveling a lot and sharing it abroad. Yeah. Um, just give us the history of it. That way we can dive in. 
Okay, yeah. I'm at 17, uh, I was an athlete uh, up in Pennsylvania. Uh, I went to, I uh, lived in a, a city called Falls, Pennsylvania. Went to Tunkhannock Area High School. I was an athlete, and uh, I was a I was a pr- fairly good athlete. I lettered in uh, sports and competed against seniors and as a as a sophomore. Uh, but when I had an issue of drinking, I I grew up in an alcoholic family. I was never beat. I was never abused. I just that was the staple of our uh, kitchen table was, mm-hmm. was booze. So. Um, I learned to uh, cope with my problems, but I was an athlete, so I struggled with that. I had an opportunity um, against my parents' wishes. I had an opportunity to go out drinking one night with an older cousin. Um, he wanted to go shoot some pool at about 11.30 at a bar, drinking, shooting pool with an older stepbrother, too, who drove us there. And he decided he wanted to rob the bar. And it was kind of like out of the blue, uh, my favorite cousin, love this guy, you know, probably... Mm-hmm. I probably worshipped the ground he walked on. You know? Right, yeah. He was 24 years old. and So we. I knew I wasn't going to do it. I didn't have the heart. I didn't have the, um, it wasn't even my nature to, mm-hmm. you know, to do something like that. But we decided to leave. If you could do it, you do it yourself. And right, he, right. He walked back in. Right, um, you're on your own. Yeah, he walked back in. And instead of just robbing, he, he, he murdered the owner, the bartender, wow. who was the owner. And wow. then uh, we waited for him. We walked in, and, of course, he was, looking for money. He said, come on, help find some money. Um, found, found about a thousand dollars, took off to New York city <clears throat> to, to kind of speed it ahead. Went to New York city, uh, walking the streets. He said he had a plan. I knew I was in trouble. Mm. Um, sobered up the next day. And it was, it was like, what in the world happened? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, I should be in high school right now. I should be mm. with my friend's high school mm-hmm. instead walking the streets of Spanish Harlem in and out of shooting galleries. He, took the money and put it in a needle and put in his arm. So I wow. turned myself in the next day. He said, you can run with me or you can turn yourself in. So I turned myself in. I was arrested and charged, and I was given an attorney. And um, within 30, 90 days of my arrest, he had he recommended pleading guilty to murder. This was like a public defendant? Yeah, public defender. Uh-huh. He could be out in 10 to 12 years. So I, so I pleaded guilty, and the day before my 18th birthday, I was sentenced to life without the possibility of parole. Oh my <clears throat> In my mind, I'm thinking, you know, 10, 12 years, if I get to the state prison, I'm gonna get a, you know, get an education, get a job, do whatever they require you in the prison system. I had no idea. I've never been in prison before. Mm-hmm. But I just wanted to do what I needed to do. Mm-hmm. And so uh, my, my adult time started on my 18th birthday. And uh, I write I write in a book that uh, that moment when I went in and uh, through the medical department they asked a lot of questions, <clears throat> and the uh, the lady um, said, "What's your date of birth?" And I said, three nine sixty, and she wrote and she looked up. She goes, "Happy birthday!" And so I write about um, you know a story in there that um, that that happened, and then I got a card, and the card had my institution number AK four one nine two. So we, we ask people, where were you at on your 18th birthday? What did you get? Mm-hmm. Well, I got, you know, not trying to feel sorry for myself. It was mm-hmm. just the reality of looking back and writing the book. Mm-hmm. You know, here I got my 18th birthday. I got a, a prison uniform and um, uh, a card that had my institution number on it. Wow. So, so, so when you, after you turn yourself in mm-hmm. and you got uh, appointed a public def- defender, um, where were your parents at this time? How, how, what was that like? Um, I had, you know, I had a, uh, a functioning alcoholic mother um, who later uh, accepted the Lord and got saved. And mm. Awesome. She awesome, awesome evangelist. Um, um, but uh, so I grew up in an alcoholic family, and it was just, we were just splintered. It was, mm. There was no family unit mm-hmm. there. You had brothers and sisters? I had brothers and sisters. We basically uh, came and gone, you know, mm-hmm. at, at our own will, you know. And... Um, so my mother would, um, she, she was with me at, at the police station. And, um, you know, she just said, Eugene, tell the truth. And that was always her time. You know, mm-hmm. Eugene, tell me, tell the truth. Mm-hmm. And so I told the truth, you know. And um, so at that point, I was arrested and charged. Mm-hmm. Um, they gave me an attorney after I gave my statement. And uh, I, I got mm-hmm. the attorney once I got to the juvenile center. A couple of days later, he came and... and uh, so I had, and he was, it was his first homicide case. Oh my God. So it was, it was, it was um, you know, without having funds and money, um, 
it's 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 true you know you, but at 17 not yeah. even 18 years old yet and and realizing the sentence you have you're thinking 10 to 12 years that's a lot to swallow even yeah I, I couldn't even comprehend i was thinking how did you make the right side out of that you're talking about education right. this and that yeah. but yeah. i mean that's even thinking i would be 27 or so 28 years old you know i'm 17 as that at those decisions make you know making those decisions I couldn't even comprehend twenty. What I would be at twenty one, or right. would I be at nineteen? Just a kid. Yeah, you you don't you don't think long term. You just don't. There's we don't think consequently as young people. No way. So okay, so you're sitting there, ten to twelve years. You go with the plea. Yes. Then what? Um, I um I remember being sentenced uh, the day before my birthday. Um, so there was nine. There was uh, first three months. Um, talking attorney recommended pleading guilty, best best move, pled guilty. Uh, waited six more months and a day. Where before, are you in Justin County Jail? Or? I, I, I was in a juvenile center. Juvenile center. Okay. I was in a Lackawanna County Juvenile Center, and which is Wilkes Barre Scranton area. Mm -hmm. And then um, my my I would be transferred back and forth to my court in Wyoming County mm -hmm. uh, in Tunkhannock, Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. So the day before my birthday, we come in and, and it was sentencing day, and they go through the whole process and and i stand up and a judge sentenced me to life without the possibility of parole for my natural life in my mind i'm thinking you know okay i still have that 10-year mark that he he's my attorney has been saying mm -hmm. you know, in 10 to 12 years uh, in good behavior so my mindset is like man i felt bad i mean i felt so bad that i didn't even have a backbone to say that night no we're not gonna do this you know and uh, yeah, I was drunk, but I remember everything, you know. But it, alcohol dethrones the alert mind, and yeah. I, I had no inhibitions. Oh, for and sure. So I just, uh, you know, I was a self centered person and, and didn't care. But I did feel guilty afterwards. I felt real bad. And so um, I knew I was part of a robbery. I knew that he was going to do it, um, even though I was outside. What happened to your cousin? My cousin, he, uh, he, was, he received a first degree life sentence plus a 10 to 20 on top of that uh, for the robbery. He took the case. He he turned himself in about a week after I did, ten days after I did. Okay. And then he took the case. He said, "Hey, I I I did it. Gene had nothing to do with it. He was he he came along because of me. You know, he was only there. And and he was my favorite cousin. You know, everybody everybody loved Bobby. He he would do anything in the world. And he treated my mother like gold. You know, anytime my mother had problems, Bobby would come to the rescue. And so, I mean, I, I you know, some years later, you know, I, I would sit down and kind of go over you know what was my mindset what what did I see in this guy you know and I and the one thing I remembered is that he treated my mother like gold uh, and I said what young person what young boy would not respect a man who respects his mom how much older was he than you seven years he was 24 years. years old right you would think, so you I'm sorry go ahead yeah. you would think that after he said you know it was me right. do it, they were like okay well we need to fix your situation yeah but that didn't no, I, yeah, and I I had been sentenced before he was. Um, I know maybe not, but I was I was definitely arrested before he was, and so, um, and then um, he turned himself in. And then mm -hmm. he ended up receiving a um, he you know the violent guy. You know he mm. he he had an outbreak and he attacked, tried to attack the judge and threatened the judge and threatened uh, during his sentencing. Yeah, oh yeah, he went crazy through the microphone, the big microphone. I remember I remember um, I was there and. I testified and, and he, you know, I was like, man, I felt bad, you know, like, mm -hmm. and uh, he said, Gene, tell the truth, tell, you know, he said, right, you know, tell the truth. And then when my stepbrother testified, um, he took that big microphone and, and literally threw it across the room, but, you know, it was attached to a cord. And mm -hmm. so he, they, he, they had to subdue him, subdue him. And, mm, and gosh. Uh, he's a real violent guy. And he's, so, he's lived a violent life all his life. So when you were sentenced, it wasn't what you were expecting. Obviously. No, I wasn't expecting. I, for some reason, I was, you know, the reality is when I got to the state correctional institution at Rock, or uh, Camp, Camp Hill, where I started my sentence, that um, when I walked into that prison and I started meeting other men who, during life, you know, I'm a young kid and young guy, and everybody's coming up saying, hey, young buck, where are you from? You know, all that. Mm -hmm. You know, how much time are you doing? I'm like, I'm doing life, but I'm getting on 10 years. And they just kind of laughed at me. They're like, what, what are you? Man, you got life, man. You're on the list. You know, there's a, there's a list of lifers, and they, that, that's called reading your papers. Yeah, check your papers. Yeah, they say you're you're a lifer, man, yeah. and uh, you're not getting out. You get dying here like the rest of us. And uh, I was like, nah. So I started I started 
realizing that life in Pennsylvania meant life. There's no parole eligibility. There's only three states, and Pennsylvania's one. So I was like, man, what do I do? So I decided to call my attorney and say, I want to go back to court. You know, whatever it takes to go back, I got the worst sentence possible. I got the same sentence as my, my cousin, as life, you know, and um, I'm, I'm going to die in here. So in, in what you said, 10 to 12 years, that's not true. And he gave me every reason. Like this guy just gave me every reason on the phone. I was on the phone about 10 minutes with me. Public he, defender? Yeah. Mm -hmm. He gave me every reason why not to. He said, if you, if you withdraw your plea and you go back, you're going to get more time. And I'm like, well, how much more time can I get? Yeah. Life, you know? <laughs> And uh, so I really felt defeated, and I, I was confused. I just had no concept of the law. I had no concept uh, and no counsel. And no help, yeah. No, no help. And so I hung up the phone. I went back to my cell, and I said, well, I'll just do my time. There was one option for a life sentence, and it's called commutation. It's with the Board of Pardons and the governor. And it's um, in the early 60s and the 70s, governors were commuting uh, men who who had life sentences to life on parole. It was a viable means of, of, of release or at least parole for men who, women who have changed and proven that through a system they mm -hmm. have for commutation. It's a mm -hmm. plea of mercy. And so when, when I heard that, I said, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll work toward my commutation process. I'll, I'll, I'll get education, vocation. Mm -hmm. I'll go through programming, psychological groups, you know, mm -hmm. long-term offender groups, yeah. stress and anger. I'll do Whatever. all, yeah, to build a resume uh, for that, you know, and, and, right. and, 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 you know, be remorseful. And so that was my only option at that time. So once I, I went back to my cell, I was like, he's not going to do nothing for me. And so I lost all my my appellate rights, I lost all my rights to go back to court after 180 days. I wasn't allowed to go back into court. So I just started my sentence, you know, and I got my fights and, you know, it's, prison's a violent place, you know. And, where, and where were you at? I was at Camp Hill uh, State Correctional Institution in Pennsylvania. Mm. It's down around the Harrisburg area. Mm. And it was for youthful offenders, you know, was, the average age was, you know, 15 to um, 25, 30. So it wasn't a juvenile detention center? No, it wasn't. It was, it, no, it wasn't keeping a juvenile. Keeping 15-year-olds in a, in a state penitentiary? If they, yeah, if they were classified as an adult. Wow. Yeah, there was some 15-year-olds. My goodness. Um, yeah. Um, so Everybody in there, young and strong. So. Yeah, <laughs> and they're all, everybody tests everybody else, you know, yeah. and they're all like, you know. So um, I remember a guy came up to me, and I don't know, I was working out in my cell, I was doing shadow boxing or something, and the guy came up, he said, he said, uh, "Hey, young buck, you get a you could get in a boxing team because they had a pretty, pretty good boxing team at the prison in the seventies, eighties." Uh, and uh, I said, "Yeah, I'm thinking about it." He says, "You know, you could have your first prison fights before you ever get in a ring." And I was like, "Oh yeah, <laughs> I don't think I don't think I like boxing, <laughs> but that is so true. It's so true. You know, you oh get to get tested." And, oh yeah. So yeah, yeah. So. My father, uh, who the guy that was uh, on the intro of this podcast, that was my dad, and he his name was Larry Reed, and he he didn't do he did half the time you did. He did I think eighteen years uh, total in a county jail. I think twelve county years in San Quentin Penitentiary mm -hmm. in Bay Area. He got busted. He was a, a drug addict and for armed robbery, but um, yeah, he would never talk about. That I'd be, ah, Dad, what's, what was it like to be in prison? Yeah. You don't want to know. Same with my dad. <laughs> you, you've got bare minimum. <laughs> yeah. Bare minimum. Bare minimum. But yeah, he, yeah, he's, yeah, that's 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 the truth of the matter. But, you know, it's it ain't no joke. So, man, you're talking about, so you're in there. How many years pass before you're like, okay, what next? Yeah. Uh, so, uh, you know, about six years um, I had got GD, did some college courses. 23, uh, 22, 23. Yeah, 20, yeah. And uh, um, I, uh, I was involved. I worked every day. I, you know, job skills and learning different jobs and looking for the better jobs. And, and they'd pay between 10 and 18 cents an hour, you know. So it was a, a means of money. I, I wasn't getting money from family or anything like that. And do you, is this money just going to like a, a an account? account? And you could buy commissary soap. And I mean, mm -hmm. the institution's mm -hmm. going to provide mm -hmm. uh, lye soap for you. And, mm -hmm. you know, it's, but um, so it gives you the opportunity yeah. to just buy some goodies. Right, right. So, so um, about six years into my sentence, it, it got old. I mean, it got real old. That mm -hmm. same old, same old waking up six o'clock in the morning. 
you know, standing up, getting counted, go to breakfast, go to work. What do you do? Give me, give me, give me that day when you're 23 and you're waking up. What exactly? What is it? Well, there's a bell that rings at 6 a.m. and and it's 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 an announcement for you to stand up. Are you, it, are you are you are you do should I'm, you share a cell? Uh, at the time, no. But uh, as years went on, uh, a few about ten years into my sentence, it was a mandatory. You it was overcrowded. Okay. Mm-hmm. So at the time, no. So you know, you you get up, you stand. They they do an institutional head count. They they want to see a live body, you know, and, mm-hmm. and uh, so you do that, and then you wait a little bit. The doors open um, to go breakfast, mm-hmm. and then you go eat as a, and as a unit. About two hundred fifty guys, you go and you go and you chow hall, and, you, and there's other people. There might be a thousand guys in the mm-hmm. chow hall. You go and eat. You get your tray. You walk through, and they put some eggs or French toast or cereal, coffee cake, and you know, and you go eat, and then you go back to your cell and you lock up. And in about another half hour, they open the door for work lines, and everybody has a job. Pretty much everybody has a job assignment, and you go and you find your work boss. They gather outside, and you and your work boss will take you to plumbing, carpentry. Uh, kitchen, laundry, there's all kinds of job. Mm. So you mm-hmm. do your job, you know, eight to four, and you come back, um, you have your lunch, you come back, and then uh, then there's that whole system again, lockdown, count, go eat, you have school um, activities, there's yard, there's gym, uh, there's different educational classes you can go to. And at nine o'clock, you're back in your cell, locked up until 6 a.m. And uh, so seven, seven days a week? Yeah, seven days a week. And so for me, um, I had a lot of friends. Uh, I had one time I had like 40 friends from high school come try to visit me, and they, they wouldn't let them in. I said, Gene, there's too many people. Yeah, you can't come in. You know, I never knew I had that many friends, you know, or yeah. the people cared about me. You know, but in the years go by, they, they go to college, they, they have families, and right. so you start, right. you know, people move on. And I try to write letters all the time. I wrote letters every day in my life to numerous people, whether you wrote me back, you know, um, or not, but I would, it was my way of mm-hmm. reaching out. Reciprocating that, yeah. I just knew prison was never the place to be. <laughs> I knew I was there for, you know, for what, what we did or what, you know, we were involved in. But I, I got old and I was trying to find something to mask the pain. And, you know, if you look hard enough, you find it. And you found some weed in there and, you know, hustled mm-hmm. some weed. And then I, I met a couple guys. They were from Philadelphia and they had drug businesses. Um, they had street businesses, and so they were doing time like me. But you know that business carried with them, and so every week we were we either meth or or some painkillers or prescription mm-hmm. uh, pills or mm-hmm. weed uh, volumes, whatever it was. And then you know for me, I was like always searching and searching, and and then I I, I was introduced to you know shooting meth, and that was it for me. I was like that's yeah, it's incredible. Mm-hmm. Um, and then do cocaine and all that. So it was a hustle, it was a lifestyle, but it kept it real quiet. And I didn't let anybody know my business, you know, but I was kind of a role model inmate in a sense. Mm-hmm. I put on, I knew how to speak, I knew how to act. I knew but you were to, coping. Yeah, I, was, I, was, I knew how to do the things I needed to do. Mm-hmm. And uh, so I did that for about two and a half years, three years. Um, and we partied, you know, and mm-hmm. I still worked out as an athlete. We, we participated in sports and all that. But I, I enjoyed masking, you know, and getting high. Mm-hmm. And it was, it was, you know, chasing after it. Uh, prior to all this happening, what was your faith like? Family? Where, where were you at? Uh, I grew up uh, early on. My my parents divorced when I was six. Uh, so after that, there was there was no church. My my dad was Irish Catholic. He he married a um, uh, a German Protestant. <laughs> <laughs> It, it, didn't go, it didn't go over real well with the, with my dad's family, and so we were always considered the black sheep of the family, you know. Uh-huh. And we we I didn't understand that then years later, but um, so we 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 went to Catholic church, you know. Mm-hmm. We'd go uh, Sunday, we'd go Saturday confession, Sunday church, mm-hmm. you know, put the money in the box and all that, and then go to the bar. Mm-hmm. And my parents would give us change and buy sodas, and we'd play shuffleboard jukebox for a couple hours until they got they got hammered, and and we went back home. And so that was kind of the, and I thought, so when I went to prison, there was, you know, there's an active church faith community, Catholics, there's, you know, Islam has their Friday Juma prayer and the Catholics and, you know, but in the Protestants, but I was just like, yeah, I, I, it, it's like oil and water. Mm. What does, what does religion have to do with life? They don't, for me, they don't, they don't mix. There's no, mm-hmm. um, but I, I, I remember meeting a couple born again Christians, not 
you know, there's there's not an inmate in the prison system that doesn't get a, a letter with a Bible track or have access to a Bible, whether we read it or not. So I, I was getting Bible tracks. Friends would, you know, say, hey, you know, Jesus loves you. And, this. and there was a couple of inmates that were really, they, they, they were walking the walk. Mm-hmm. And I would, they were lifers like me. And I would look at them. I'm like, he's smiling, singing hymns. Mm. You know, he'd get up in the morning and sing "How Great Thou Art" and walk up and down the, the, the you know, the range, and and I'm like, he got life like me, and he's smiling. I, you know, I'm not smiling. I'm miserable. Mm. So there was things that I saw that um, I could appreciate. Mm-hmm. So about nine, about nine years, nine and a half years into my sentence, um, I uh, I was going to lunch, and 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 there was the, the lady, the gal that was bringing the drugs in, she got arrested at the gatehouse. She, oh, she was working in the cafeteria? Uh, no, she was working at the gate. She was coming in as a visitor, mm. but she would bring the drugs in, mm-hmm. and she was smuggle man, and then mm. once she got to the visiting, they'd have balloons, and guys would small, small, swallow the balloons, balloons yeah. or, you know, or, or put, them, put them elsewhere to yeah. get them in. And uh, so the girl, we found out the girl got arrested, so there was nothing in the prison for about two weeks. And, you know, people were like, Gene, you got I'm like, no. And I enjoyed getting high, so... I'm kind of walking around like, man, there's got to be something more than this, you know. But I saw on a bulletin board an announcement for, it was a, a, a ministry in a chapel. And um, it didn't say anything about God. It just said prison invasion, 1986. It was a mm. big poster. And it had Teen Challenge. I remember that they had like pictures of Teen Challenge and it had worship groups and, and like speakers. And I don't know, it was something that just caught my attention. And it wasn't there the day before, you know, so I was like, what's this? Mm-hmm. And I decided to go over. Uh, um, I made a decision to go for the weekend. Um, but there was 100 men, and Larry Titus was part of this, and his church was part of this. And, mm-hmm. and uh, so they, they were allowed to walk the prison compound. They were allowed to come into chow hall. They were allowed to come eat. They wore the tethers. They had wristbands, and they were, they were civilians but they were allowed to walk around and tell you about the Lord and invite you to church. Mm-hmm. So they were doing some groundwork. And this one guy kept coming up to me and said, hey, I was an alcoholic and Jesus set me free. I don't drink no more. Uh, I'd, I'd, be out in a, I'd be out in a weight pile working out and I'd see him and he'd say, hey, I want to tell you, Jesus set me free. I was an alcoholic. And I was like, okay, so why are you telling me? Yeah. You know, why you keep telling me? Why you hammer on me on it? And uh, so I was kind of avoiding him. But So I went over Friday night and I heard... When I walked in, it was it was it was it was jumping. You know, the music was loud, and um, people were standing, clapping, hugging, and high fiving And I'm like, this is church, you yeah. know, <laughs> this is this is pretty cool, you know. And and so I went and sat down. Music stopped. The guy gets up, and he's he's sounding like Jesus loves you. And the crowd went crazy. These guys, you know, there was about 300 men in this chapel, 100 outside, 200 guys from the prison, and they just started like. Yell and I was like, man, this is this is pretty cool. Mm. So he preaches the gospel, and you know he, what I remember was Jesus died uh, for our sins. He was buried the third day. He rose again, and in him there's e- eternal life. Mm-hmm. And I'm sitting there. I'm like, oh, there's no reason why I wouldn't believe it. But what do I do with that? Right. Mm-hmm. And 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 I and he said, real men make commitments. Real men make commitments. That hit home because I never made a commitment. Anything. Anything got tough, I'd quit. I had a quitter's mentality. Um, so I, I, I don't make a commitment that night. I go back the next night, and I'm, I'm sitting there, and I'm like, my stomach's churning, my hands are sweating, and, and the people are coming up to me, and they're saying, hey, you, you a Christian? I'm like, no. Have you made a commitment tonight? No. Have you made a commitment? No. And they kept asking me that. So I was kind of avoiding, yeah. you know. So I was sitting there, I heard the gospel again. The message, Jesus died, rose again. In him, there's eternal life. Real men make commitments. And I'm like, man. So at the end of the night, actually, there was about a 20-minute period that people could just mingle. And we're, I'm standing in the middle of this prison chapel, and people are, like, coming over to me. They're, like, locking eyes on me, and they're, like, walking over. Hey, how you doing? I'm so-and-so. Do you know the Lord? I'm like, no. So I got to this point. Let's <laughs> stay there. And if I saw you looking at me, I put my eyes down. I'm like, this guy's coming over here. I <laughs> hope, I'm going to brush him off, you know, just look away. Yeah, yeah. And I, I was starting to be good at that. Mm-hmm. And this is like a 20 minute period. And, and I just, a couple of people, I brushed them off, you know, like, oh, he's coming over here. So I, I hear behind me, how you doing tonight? And I turn around and he says, have you made a commitment? I was like, tactic <laughs> coming up behind me now, you know? <laughs> and, and I said, I said, no. And I'm looking at this guy. I'm like, no. I said, uh, I said, but I know some Christians. 
yeah. <laughs> I know I, some, I have some friends. I know some in Macon. Yeah, I, I, I said, let me ask you a question. I said, are you a Christian? He said, yeah. And I remember this guy, kind of like blonde hair. He had a yellow members, members only jacket on, like a zip up jacket. And uh, he was from the outside and uh, from the community. And I said, uh, I said, how long have you known Jesus? He said, since I was four years old. I said, you know, Jesus since you're four. I'm 26 plus and I have nine and a half years in. I, you know, I'm hustling. I got some money and hustling drugs. and got to drug, get high and, oh, you know, all that stuff, you know. And, and when he said, uh, yeah, he said, I knew I'd be a missionary at five. I was like, dang, I said, I'm like a big zero. It wasn't condemnation, but I, for me, I was like, I'm right. not where I should be. Right, and yeah. it just hit me right there. I was like, I'm not where I should be. If a five year old can have a plan for his life, how come I can't? Mm. So uh, he says, "Wait right here." And he goes, he like thirty seconds comes back, gives me his business card. He said, "Hey, if you need anything, give me a call." His name is Larry Titus, and he mm. says, "He said, if you need something, you need a Bible, you need some shoes, you need sneakers, you need some money, you need someone to talk to, give me a call." And I'm looking at him. I'm like, "This guy doesn't know him." I'm, I'm I'm putting a needle in my arm, caught in pornography, mm-hmm. um, lying, hustling, stealing, cheating. You know, just, I, I had literally been living in darkness that was like grit. Right. You know, I yeah. love I loved making my cell dark and just sitting there. Mm. And I didn't, you know. So he leaves, I leave. I go back to my cell. I can't sleep. I'm like, I keep hearing hallelujah, I keep hearing praise the Lord, I keep hearing Jesus. Like, High fives in your Yeah, I, yeah, I'm, I'm like, I'm, I'm seeing all this stuff. It's like, and I'm like, I can't sleep. I keep sitting up on the edge of my bed. And I'm like, oh, I go back Sunday morning and I hear that gospel again. Jesus died, rose again. Real men make commitments. And I'm like rocking in my, I'm thinking in my mind, I'm rocking because I want, I, I want to get up. I can't. And I'm like, Gene, get up, get up. So these guys come over and they say, you, you look like you want to accept the Lord. I'm like, I couldn't speak, I couldn't move, and I was sweating, my stomach was churning, but I, in my mind, I wanted to, and uh, um, somehow or another, just was able to like kind of lean forward and, and stood up. In my mind, I was saying yes. In my mind, I was saying mm-hmm. yes, yes, I want to be a Christian, yes, yes. And so we went up front, got on my knees, and, and just prayed a sinner prayer. You know, Jesus, come in my life, I believe. You died and rose again for me, I want to live for you, forgive me for my sins. And literally, I felt this weight come off me. I, you know, I say chains broke off me, mm-hmm. but this weight, uh, literally, I was a power lifter, and I knew it was to put hundreds of pounds on my back and with the tighten the belt up, mm-hmm. and, and it's like it takes your breath away for about eight seconds to you, and that's why I, that was gone. And I was like, oh my goodness, something happened to me. I didn't wow. know. So he said, go back, read your Bible. So I'm reading my Bible, and, and the one thing I realized uh, that, that I was forgiven. Mm. I knew, I, I mean, I knew, I knew God forgave me my sins, right. and I, I knew he loved me. Those two things were like so, the more I read the Bible, I knew God loved me. That's huge. For, and I knew he huge. forgave me. Mm-hmm. And then, of course, I had so many odds with people. <laughs> and so I get on my knees, I said, God, thank you for forgiving me, and please forgive me for hurting Danny. <laughs> and, and the Holy Spirit would say, yeah, I'm not Danny, go talk to Danny. Uh, I was mm. like... Oh, is that how that works? Yeah. You know? So I spent the next couple of days literally going through the cell block, uh, apologizing to guys. And it was humbling, um, but it just, I realized God forgave me, and there's no sin against me that is greater than my sin. That's cool that immediately in in opening up like that and having an encounter with the Lord that immediately you feel something within your heart, which you say, the Holy Spirit, hey, go, go. Go ask for forgiveness. Go ask for forgiveness. So that's something that that the listeners in this podcast focuses on is is the Holy Spirit, and it immediately goes to work, and it goes to work within your heart in the same way that the Holy Spirit was drawing you mm-hmm. to make that commitment to do something. He had to draw me that whole weekend. It's like people say, "Well, what is that? What they don't know what the Holy Spirit? Mm-hmm. What is that? It's it's how can you explain it? But you're explaining it perfectly. You you felt compelled something inside you after going to the word. Mm -hmm. I mean, the Bible says, Jesus said, listen, um, in in the Lord's prayer, forgive us our our sins. We forgive those who sin against us. For if you don't forgive those, your heavenly father will forgive you. But that's something that's just innate was put in you. Mm -hmm. It was was unfolding within me. And I, you know, I, I didn't know the verses. I, I didn't, you yeah, know, I might have read the Bible a little work. bit here and yeah. there, you know. And there was a couple of verses that I, I, I enjoyed reading, 
um, I thought more poet, poetic, you know. Right, sure. But yeah. I'd never, I didn't know the Lord. I didn't know he yeah. was real. So, so Larry Titus, so snuck yeah. behind you. Yeah. 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 So, <laughs> uh, I, so, that full Nelson. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the love of God, you know. And uh, he, so, he was the one with the with the blonde hair and the yeah with the, 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 yeah, the, the members only jacket members only jacket. <laughs> I, <picture home. laughs> I yeah I still remember him coming up and real smooth wow. like he he didn't like he didn't he didn't tell me that he, he repented of his sins he just said you know I, I accepted the Lord at four and and I knew yeah. God's calling to be a missionary at five yeah. and I was like wow yeah. so I, I write him a letter I so I go back and about a, about a couple of days later I go through my pocket and I find this car and. But at that time, I'm, I'm telling everybody that I'm a Christian. Everybody knows I'm a Christian because they're coming. They say, hey, you got any, you got any weed? I'm like, no, nah, I'm a Christian now. They're mm-hmm. like looking at me. They're like, something's different about you, man. Mm-hmm. You, you got this glow about you or something. He said, you know, I had, I had people that I never talked to before. They would come to my cell and they would sit there and look at me like, something's different about you, man. He said, there's... And, you know, now I know it was, you know, the Holy Spirit, the freedom. Mm-hmm. And, and it freedom, was manifesting... Yeah. Uh, in, a, in a human body that was it. that was once bound, now it's free. Wow. So, That's cool. my so I write Larry. Larry's response. I tell Larry. I write Larry like a six eight page letter front and back <laughs> about everything I've ever you know garbage. And and I was like, this guy's moving. You know, right, right, right. This guy's out of here. He said, he said, put me on your visit list. I'm coming to visit you. Wow. And next week, where did he live at the time? He he literally lived like two miles from the prison. Oh, his church, wow. his church was literally a mile or so from the prison. Okay, Christ okay. Community Church there in, in Camp Hill, and then Larry was the senior pastor there. So he he started to come in. So Larry would come in on Mondays, he in his day off, and whatever he taught his men on Saturday, he, he was you know Larry Larry has always been about men ministry and, mm-hmm. and missions, mm-hmm. and uh, whatever he taught he would come in and share with me. So I would say, Larry, can I get your sermon notes? You know, Larry <laughs> don't really have sermon notes. He, he memorizes everything and just, right. it just <laughs> you know, pours it out. But, there, you know, outlines, I would get outlines from him, and I would study him, and I would memorize the verses. Because one of the things that um, they really taught me was memorize the word. Memorize the word, memorize the word. Just don't mm. read it, memorize it. Mm-hmm. And he said, I don't care if you understand or not, memorize it. That's and good. so that was, that was, for me, that was... Uh, it was easy because I had time. And um, so Larry would visit me and, you know, everything from being teachable to correctable, um, learn those things about prayer, uh, you know, praying in the name of Jesus, praying out loud. There's no silent prayer. Things that he would drop on me, I would just like, okay. So he would come visit you and just... Yeah, he would just he'd spend a half hour, or I'm sorry, an hour and a half on his day off. And he'd buy... How, how long did he do that? Uh... 25 years. 25 years. Yeah, until I got out. Yeah. Now, when, okay, so he moved, you know, when he would move um, to different states, he would come once a month. And then when he moved to Texas, six years before my release, he would come once a year. I can't even get a text back from some friends. (laughs) 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 I was like, man, I texted you last year. (laughs) Wait a minute. Okay, so, so, wait a minute. So, yeah. Up until that point, before he moved, he'd come see you every day, every week, every every yeah, every Christmas, every birthday. Um, he would he would come no matter where he was at. He'd visit me on my birthday. For 25, uh, Twenty five years. years. Wow. And I joke around. Um, That's crazy. Joke around. He he missed one birthday. He 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 was having a heart attack. He was in Cleveland. He was he was <laughs> oh in Ohio gosh. somewhere. He actually had a heart attack, and uh, um, he was in the ER on March 9th. I I probably had I probably. This was probably in the, somewhere in the 2000s and early 2000s, and uh, and uh, they, I found out they he he say I'm, I'll be there on, and he, he didn't come, and then found out that he was having a. But the person who was with him told me Scott, this his his grandson-in-law, I guess, told him he said uh, doctor said you ain't going nowhere. He said no, I have to go visit my son in, in prison. It's his birthday. I've never missed his birthday. So yeah. the guy was just incredibly faithful. I don't know if he's human or not. Yeah, you know. Yeah, no, no. But no if you told he, him this, he would, he he would he would he would dumb it down. Yeah. Or something. Well, you know, would, one of the things yeah, I, I think his comment would be, I, he said, "I just want to be faithful." So the things that I I just learned, I learned so much yeah, from that him is himself. just so yeah. yeah. That is incredible. And then, so yep. So ten years in, give us the run through because you did how many. Years total, 34 years, nine months, 15 days. 
So I spent another 25, I got to say, I spent another 25 years oh my gosh. in the prison system before uh, you know, the events happened that, that revealed And that. you're going back and forth with, with appeals? Are you just no. doing hard time? No, you know? I was doing the commutation process. Okay, you're still on that process, yeah, hoping still, that that's going to... So 11 years, uh, spending time with Larry praying, and I said, I'm going to file commutation. So I filed my commutation, and it's a petition to the Board of Pardons, and you need uh, the votes from the port of pardons to go to the governor, and the governor would sign it. Well, I filed my petition, I get denied. Mm-hmm. And uh, there was a verse in Thessalonians that says, Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God concerning you, Christ Jesus. Uh, I was just believing it. And so whether I had a visit, I'd give thanks. Whether I didn't, I would give thanks. I would literally get on my knees and say, oh God, gosh. thank you for... You know, and I would, I would said, okay, I was challenged. You know, give God thanks that you got denied, and so I literally say, God, thank you for denying me because I, I realize you're sovereign and you have a plan for my life, and it's not including getting out. So I was doing God's will right there. Yeah, you know, and it was unbelievable what we were able to do in the prison system: lead others to the Lord, pray for the sick, you know, um, wash feet, have communion. You know, we we're, were having, there was community there, you know. Uh, did I did I want to get out? Yes. Did I ever, yeah, I, definitely. I would pray for my release. But I knew God's will um, because of the word, you know. And the more I read the word, the more I knew God's will. You got me doing a faith check right now. I'm like, man, I need to step So I started, I started just <laughs> learning praise. You know, I've read books, you know, the Crothers books, you know, pray, prison to praise and all that. I read it. I, I would read books, uh, um read the Bible, read books, just being exposed to other, you know, watch television shows. And um, so I, I just just try to absorb um, the Word of God and, and, and practice it, you know. I, I just so. listening to it, it it's, it's almost like I'm dumbfounded because I don't even know how to respond to that. Yeah. I'm like... <laughs> I'm just absorbing. Hmm. I'm absorbing, literally, because I'm trying to put myself in that position. And I know that's pretty much impossible to do because everybody has their own story. I mean, mm. all people that can relate to you, obviously, that have had the same path. But for somebody like me or for somebody like Jay, or people that are listening, the fact that you said that, you th- for example, you took that, that scripture and all things give thanks and that you would just cons- you know, consume the word of God. So you're saying up for the first nine years, you kind of just, you were a kid, you did your thing, you partied. Mm-hmm. You're introduced to the gospel. Larry Titus grabs a hold of you. This guy is faithful to you. And over the course of the next additional eleven years, you you were you were going through this. What you say, computation? Yeah. Process with with Larry visiting with yeah. people with absorbing with mm-hmm. Christian. Yeah. You're following the Christian path right. here. You're yep. doing what you're supposed serving, to do the next yeah. eleven serving, years. Serving in the church. And in your mind, you're praying for right. this sure. release. But you've accepted, that's the part that's really yeah. digging down mm-hmm. deep in me right now, is that you accepted God's sovereignty and his will. Yeah. Um, this is just on a small scale of what you're uh, talking about, but I believe it's kind of like, you know, there's. I was reading the word this morning, getting ready for, uh, I'm preaching um, this Sunday at our church, and <clears throat> God uh, dealt with me on sacrifice. Mm-hmm. And I'm a worship pastor, it's what I do. And, uh, but I see that the biggest thing that, uh, how we can prepare to worship is some people kind of replaced worship music and worship with actual worship. When I think really, in essence, real worship is a cost of something, is a sacrifice of something, yeah. is, yeah. is giving away. So I started to study just Old Testament sacrifices and one, they did all different kinds of sacrifices, whether it be like burnt offerings and, you know, different offerings that they did, they mm-hmm. would do. But the burnt offering literally means you give it, it burns up. Everything is consumed, and it's never to come back. Mm-hmm. It's like I give that, and it's my way of saying this is a, co- a covenant, a commitment to you, yeah. and I give it to you, and it's, mm-hmm. I'm never going to get that thing that I gave back. Yeah. It's burnt. <laughs> and they actually started talking about, like, can you imagine the smell of it? This, they call it savory smell of, yeah. the, uh, of, the, of the burnt offering. It's like, it's barbecue. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the sauce. There's bread. There's different things. <laughs> yeah. Different. It's, 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 but when I think about it, when I, when I think of you coming to the, not, um, you didn't settle, but you just, you settled in the Lord. You settled mm-hmm. in his way yeah. for your life. And then in, in that way, it's kind of like, 
it's a it's a total surrender of something. I give it to you, and then whatever it is, and somehow yeah. some joy and some well because. God is enough. I mean, you, you sacrifice your freedom, if, that, if that's what it is. I say, God, my freedom, I don't have a right to freedom. I, and, and I literally say, God, thank you for being an aisle because I had that awareness that I, I don't have a right to freedom. I don't have a right to good food. I don't have a right to, I'm a servant. You know, and so the, those things kind of played it. Now, was it easy? No. Right. Did I get it all at one time? But the more I did it, so like, back to so it was a 25 year period so i 11 years i got denied at 12 years i got denied i refiled 12 and and then after 12 i said well let me you know kind of build my resume and 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 try to gain some more support and I, at 17 i filed again were you doing this completely on your own uh i the paperwork I would do, I would get some counsel from friends and, you know, would other inmates who filed, I'd say, would, you know, what helped you, what you do, you know, and um, how, how can my, my petition to the Board of Pardons uh, be more appealing or whatever, you know. Mm-hmm. And Larry would introduce me to some of his friends. Uh, um, Christine and Michael Papsons were, were good friends at them, and they helped me walk me through some stuff. Mm. So at, at 17, I got denied, but one of the things that was always consistent uh, when I would go back, and not just when I got denied, when I didn't get a visit, when I didn't get money order, when, you know, instead of being moping around, I would, I would literally go to my cell and say, God, thank you that I didn't get a visit, mm. you know, or, and it be, because I, the two things that I realized about God, he's attracted to two things. He's attracted to brokenhearted and he's attracted to a grateful heart. And so when I, when I, you know, was I brokenhearted? There was times I was so brokenhearted. I was like, God, I can't do another day in here, you know? And, and, and you, when, you, when you reveal that to him, he, 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 he joins you. He, he draws close, and he draws close to a grateful heart. And there was times I said, thank you. And, I, and God was like, yeah, I'll, I'll accept the word, but you're not really grateful. <laughs> you know, because yeah. he, he knows our hearts. So you have to, yeah. you know. You're real like, with them. Yeah. yeah. And so you, you, sometimes your attitude has to adjust. Like, no, God, um, your will is better than mine. So I got at 24, I'll kind of tell you. So the time period, so 11, I got denied. 12, I got denied. 17, 24 years, I got denied. And then I filed again at 30. And I waited two and a half years, and it was um, 32 and a half years, they notified me that I got denied. Oh, my gosh. And uh, so when they denied me, I was sitting at a table like this with five um, institutional, uh, I had a psychologist, I had a security, I had a deputy warden, I had a couple of the counselors. And they said, Gene, uh, and I was, man, I was smiling. I, this is the fifth time I, I knew. I knew they were going to release me. I mean, God had moved. I had... I had a district attorney that prosecuted my case for me. He wrote letters to, to, to the governor. He wrote letters to, to people for me. He said, Gene should be released. Um, I had a uh, senior, senior deputy attorney general for Pennsylvania. You're still in the same prison the whole time? Uh, I was at Camp Hill Prison, uh, Camp Hill Prison Institution for 12 years, and I transferred uh, because of a prison riot, uh, destroyed the prison. I got transferred to uh, SCI Rockview, which is in the center of the state. It's Belfont, mm-hmm. Pennsylvania. So I was there the rest of my sentence. Um, and so I got denied. And I remember shaking her hands, and I just looked him in the eye, and I said, thank you. Tears. I mean, my, I was ready to just like, ah, you know, I was hold, trying to hold it together, you know. Mm-hmm. So disappointed because I'm thinking, I've got to call Larry and say, Larry, I, I got denied again. And you are how old at that time? Um, uh I think I was released when I was 52. So I was 50. Yeah, I was 50 Gosh. or so. Gosh. And uh, mm. so I was like, I called my sister and I got to call my friends. And I have high school friends that were faithful coming to visit. Mm. You know, God rejoined us. They were saved, born again. They had ministries. They were coming to visit. I was taking my friends out on the visits. Uh, Larry would bring people in. So we had like, it was a, it was a wonderful community, community yeah. ministry. Yeah. And so I got denied, so I shook their hands, and I was leaving. I was walking down the hallway, down the steps, across the prison yard to my cell block, and I'm going back to my cell. I'm going to you know, run to the Lord, because I learned, I learned to run to the Lord um, immediately. Mm-hmm. Just good or bad, just run to the Lord. So you waited to get to your, yeah. your thing, and then that... Your, your... And, and that's when, I, as I was going, I heard the Holy Spirit say, I want you to get on your knees and thank me. 
And I'm like, yeah, it's okay. You know, I'm thinking, okay, yeah, that's, that's the plan. But I got to my cell. I shut my cell door. I had a single cell at the time. I shut my cell door, and I'm pacing. I can't. I can't pray. I can't. I'm like, I can't even bend my knees. I'm like, man, I'm, I'm like mad. No, I was just disappointed. And I was like, who do I tell first? My sister, Larry, who I call, you know? And I just kept, kept hearing the Holy Spirit. Get on your knees. And uh, so somehow or another, my knees bent <laughs> right by the side of bed. And I, man, I ball, I lost. I grabbed the pillow, put it on my face. And first, my first thought was, I'm going to die in here, but I'm going to leave a legacy for other guys. I'm going to wow. leave an example oh, for other God. men. And okay. And, and so that, that flashed through my mind, but I could still hear the Lord saying, thank me. He was like, okay, you know, okay, but thank me. So I opened my mouth and I said, God, thank you for denying me. And these things came out of my mouth. God, thank you for providing me, protecting me, and promoting me. And when I said those three words, God said, grace. He said, that's, that's, that's grace. Grace provides, protects, and promotes you. So I never had to promote myself. I, I never had to protect myself with fists again, uh, as long as I humble myself. I never had to worry about anything as long as I gave. God provided me. Hmm. I never, I, my shower shoes never wore out. My soap never went out. I always had coffee. I always had snacks. I always had, I always had something. I always had some snacks, food. I would, you know, I mm -hmm. had the best jobs mm -hmm. and, and uh, best cell assignments. You know, if you can have a good cell assignment, mm -hmm. you know, <laughs> you know, and, uh, you know, and so I said that, God, thank you. And he said this, I'm going to release you, but not based on your effort, not on who you know or what you've accomplished. And when I heard that, this peace just came over me, and I'm thinking, what do I do now? I have nothing. <laughs> I got nothing other than my resume. I got nothing other than my friends. I have, I have Larry's introduced me to a lot of people. I've met people through ministries, um, you know, just writing letters and communicating. Mm -hmm. um, and so what I did, so I stood up. And I was standing in my cell. I was just kind of like, you know, kind of like dazed in a sense. I'm like, what do I do? And the Lord says, go back to serving. Go back to work. Go back to getting up in the morning, praying, and reading. Well, what happened was I do. And little did I know there was a new law of Supreme Court. The United States Supreme Court ruled on a case uh, of a lifer who did not kill. They sentenced, they gave this juvenile life without parole for third strike. And... Uh, the, the Supreme Court said um, juveniles who were sentenced, who, who did not kill, who did not intend to kill or did not know should not be subject to life without parole. Well, that was a Supreme Court ruling that came out and people knew about it. And then we were, all the juvenile lifers were notified since it applied to us. And they said, hey, we, we, here's a petition. You got to put your name, your docket number. You got to file with your own court. We can't represent you but you have to file these petitions. So in June of 2010, I filed my petition, and it was granted. Everybody I know was denied. Hmm. Everybody I knew that filed mm -hmm. was denied. Mine was granted. At that point in time, I had brothers coming up to me talking about, I had a dream about you. I came to your cell, and your cell was empty. Hmm. Hmm. I had another, I had, another uh, I had a chaplain, a volunteer chaplain said, Gene, I had a dream. I was driving home from the prison, there was three lifers in the back seat of the car. I looked, and the two had a worry on her face, and you had a big smile. And the Lord told me, you had to take those other two guys back, but Gene's okay. You know, these dreams came, you know, these people were coming up to me, and I'm like, okay. Yeah, these are pray. your friends that would visit you? Yeah. And... No, these are inmates. Oh, these are inmates? These are fellow inmates. These are fellow inmates. Oh, my that they, gosh. They said they were having dreams wow. about this. Oh, and those I'm thinking, dream, dreams are... And I was like, I was like, okay, you know, listen, I'm, I, I still have life. I'm just getting back into court. I have no idea what I'm looking at. And so time goes by. It took about a year to get back into court. I get back into court, and then the things started happening. Um, they started revealing that my original attorney had lied to me. He pled me into an illegal plea agreement, and he, I was sentenced unconstitutionally. Mm. But it would take the courts, again, take a DA, take a judge to agree on all this. And in a matter of another few months, uh, the district attorney, he agreed that I've been sentenced illegally. Um, a judge, we had to get a judge to agree on it. And so I found myself back in the court uh, April of 2012. And uh, on April 3rd, 2012, and I had um, 
um, the judge and the DA and my attorney and, you know, they're all talking, the, the legal jargon and all the, and I'm just sitting there. I, I, I knew um, they vacated. They said my life sentence was unconstitutional, but I was still guilty. And I agreed early on in the process that I would waive my rights and you can give me whatever sentence you want mm. in the sense that I just want to spend time with my family. So I'm standing there, the judge says, do you have anything to say? And I stood up and I apologized. You know, I said, you know, first I, I, I realized I'm a product of two great investments, Jesus who died for me and the people who invested in my life. You know, think, I didn't name names, but you know, Larry Titus and the Papsons and my family and my friends, they all invested in my life. You know, I didn't get here on my own. So I uh, apologized uh, through like tears, trying to breathe, you know, breathe, trying to, um, and I never did that when I was 17. I didn't even have an idea about standing up and saying, you know, I'm sorry. So I got to apologize and I thought, man, if I go back to prison, I, I had an opportunity there that I never had when I was 17. So I, I sit down and the judge, they're talking again. They're, they're talking about going back two years. Uh, make parole and maybe a year. And my attorney's like countering with judge what about a year. And, and uh, next thing you know, he says, okay, I've heard enough. And uh, the judge says, having served 34 years, nine months, 15 days to defend it, G. McGuire has served as maximum. So as he said, 34 years, nine months, I'm like, how much time is that? How much time do I have to go back? Because I don't, I don't know how much time I have up to that date. I, I got rid of calendars, you know. And I just stopped counting. And, uh, and then he, as before I could even, he said, having served 34 years, nine months, 15 days, the defendant has served his maximum sentence Whew. and is released effective this date. And the courtroom went nuts. I had like 50 friends, and I could hear, praise the Lord. Was Larry Titus there? Uh, no, Larry was on a plane to Brazil. <laughs> okay. <laughs> He was on a plane to Brazil, I believe, yeah. And, uh, but he, he had been in the process. He'd been mm -hmm. in contact with He knew with the what court. was going on. He yeah. knew exactly. They were calling him. The courts were calling him, and oh, everybody was in contact. And, and so he knew step by step what was going on. So I, um, I hear this roar of just, wow, praise the Lord, clapping. And the judge clears the, he just walks off the bench. He just gets up and leaves. The sonographer just gets up and takes her thing and leaves. So I'm saying, thank you, judge. Thank you, judge. Thank you. And next thing you know, it gets real quiet, and someone yells, unshackle him, release him from his chains. He's a free man. Yeah. It's like this big, bellowing voice, you know, like Charlton Heston, you know. And, <laughs> and a friend of mine told me it sounded like an angel of the Lord, you know, later on. Everybody heard it. So uh, they come over there and shackle me, and they, they hand me some clothes. And they said, Gene, go change Mary to my sister. Take your brother home. You know, it's like. Surreal. It's like uh, I saw in your videos. You said she was hugging you as they were taking the cuffs yeah, off. Yeah, was like <laughs> yeah, she was hugging. She she. Uh, so the when they when they released me, I was still shackled. And after you know unshackle him, my sister was climbing over chairs to get to me. And the sheriff, I can hear the sheriff. I couldn't see my sister. I can hear Mary. Hold on, Mary. Hold on. Would we'll give us a minute. She goes, No, I'm not waiting. I waited 35 years for him. So she has my neck and hugging me. My niece and nephews are all crying. I'm, we're all crying, you know, or we're a mess. And uh, I was laughing, and I was like, oh, my goodness, and crying. And so um, just a courtroom full of uh, friends and um, just faithful people. So I, I changed, and I, I, I go spend some time with my sister. I spent three weeks with my sister uh, before I'm headed to Dallas. I already knew I was coming to Larry. Larry um, and Debbie both, they had come to the prison uh, with a at some point in time in this process. And they said, what do you want to do? And I said, I want to come down to Dallas and work for you guys. He said, well, you have a, you have a home and, and a ministry to start. And uh, um, so I knew I was coming to Dallas. So I spent some time with my family and um, pried my sister's fingers off my arm to get on a plane. <laughs> that phone call you made, who was that to? Oh, so, the yeah, voicemail. I, yeah, so I, I, during, as soon as I was released, you know, people were, had had iPads. I thought it was an etch a sketch board. I, I, I didn't know. I never saw a cell phone, never saw an iPad. They were uh, following me around, you know. They were like picture frames in your yeah, guys' hands. Yeah, I was like, what's going on? You know? And I was like, kept looking. Just wait a minute, yeah, sir. <laughs> so I didn't know, you know, technology. Right, yeah. Someone hands me a cell phone and they said, Hey, someone so from California wants to talk to you. They just learned of your release. So I'm like trying to hold the phone up to at first I looked at it like and it, they're like and I was like, I can't hear it. They said, put it to your ear. I'm like, I can't hear it. And it was upside down. <laughs> So uh, those those things is unbelievable. But so I did oh get Larry gosh. on the phone. Somebody called Larry, and so 
we got a voicemail. Now I'm thinking, answer machine. So I'm like, Larry, you there? Larry, Larry, you dad, dad, you there? Oh, you I'm, I'm like, set free. Yeah. And they, they released me, you know? And I'm like crying. And, and I'm like, man, thank you so much for praying for me. And, and I said, pick up, pick up. You know, the thing is like, pick up, pick up. <laughs> if you're there, pick up. Because I'm thinking, you know, the old, that's my, my, my As I was listening to it, I was just like, I was like, maybe he thinks. My thinking, yeah. <laughs> and uh, so anyway, and uh, so call me on anybody's cell phone, call me on it. And so Larry has saved that, you know? He, oh, he, my And so gosh. it's unbelievable that... Um, um, is that on? Is that online? Yeah, it's uh, on the website. It's a video. It's a short little testimony video, yeah. and it has, it has the on. voicemail on. Yeah. Oh my so gosh. So it's unbelievable. So it's so cool. So, um, let I me spent, let me see that. I'm gonna right. I'm gonna edit this. We can yeah. um, fast forward to it. Okay. But let me let me pull it up real quick because that'd be cool to hear. <laughs> yeah. He's hugging my neck, and the sheriff's taking off the chains, and and they're falling to the ground, and the, and the, and the shackles taken off, and I stood there. As a free man, no longer restricted by any by any standards, um, I, I was set free by Christ, and and here I was set free by man to the courts. and And I remember they they gave me some clothes, and and they and they the sheriffs handed me some clothes and said, "Gene, go change." And looked to my sister and said, "Mary, take your brother home." Hey, Mary. Hi, this is Bob Meyer. I'm standing next to Gene. A free man, he's on the phone with uh, the paps and trying to get a hold of you so you can talk to him. Let me see if he can leave a message for you. Larry, Dad, what's up, buddy? I'm out. <laughs> I can't talk. Uh, but, uh, man, I'm so proud of you, man. I'm so faithful. Uh, you, you've been so faithful to me over the years. And, uh, uh, this is the result of you praying for me. I love you guys. Debbie, I love you. And I can't wait to talk to you in person. If you hear pick up, I don't know where you're at. I don't know where you're at. Please pick up. I need to hear your voice. And I love you guys. I love you guys. And uh, Rob's here and Natalie and Marty and Veronica and Marie and my family. And oh my goodness, Bjorn and Steve, Sands and Gail. And oh my goodness, it's just amazing. And I love you guys. Thank you for everything you do for me. And uh, I miss you so much. <laughs> I wish you were here. <laughs> oh. I just love you. If you get call me, call me on some cell phone, please. <laughs> call me on anybody's cell phone, please. I love you. Bye. Hmm. Oh. Dead jerker right there, brother. Yeah, Man. it's like yesterday. Like yesterday. Wow. Yeah. Gene, people need to hear about this book. Hmm. And the book, again, I want to I pull it up here, guys. Unshackled. And, uh, oh, my goodness. What a powerful testimony. On my phone. Just what, a, what a story. Oh. oh, this is cool. It's got pictures and everything yeah. in it. Um, and I want to I want to encourage everybody that's yeah. that's watching this. They can get this probably on Amazon. Um, it's Amazon paperbacks on Amazon. The hardback is through my website. You okay. can just go to genemcguire dot org. Genemcguire dot org. Yeah, O G. <laughs> okay, when camera's out. And uh, <laughs> that's fine. Yeah. Um, genemcguire dot org. Okay, and uh, you're also. Um, you're you're going around and you 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 speak. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Tell me a bit a little bit about that. You speaking at like men's retreats, churches. Uh, yeah. You know, I I've spent a couple yeah you know, books been out three years. Um, churches, men's um, retreats, businesses. Um, in De- December, I was invited uh, to a, a printing company in Dallas, mm. and uh, they they asked me to come and and uh, to mm. speak to their employees. That's cool. Yeah, I, I do that a lot in, in the, with companies. And sure. A lot of times they're Christian owned, and and the owners are like, "Hey, you know, I really want to reach my employees, but maybe I'm not the best guy. You know, I'm their boss." Yeah. And so they'll have me come in, and they'll they'll buy books for everybody, and yeah. it's just it's it's an evangelistic uh, means of. That's so effective, and yeah. they get to speak into their lives and employees, uh, high schools, um, 
mm-hmm. rehabs. Last mm-hmm. night I was at the mm-hmm. Pine Street, speaking to the Pine Street residents, mm-hmm. uh, both men and women. I do that monthly as a volunteer, mm-hmm. part of the community, and just invest in those guys. And mm-hmm. So we, we do that. And so wherever... Um, as I spoke at uh, a car dealership. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Skating rinks. Uh, yeah, yeah. It, it, yeah. It, doesn't, it doesn't matter. You yeah. Know, they, yeah. Uh, uh, a home, they invited football players uh, on Friday night, they feed them spaghetti, or on Thursday night, they feed them spaghetti. Uh, Dr. Harris, uh, he, mm-hmm. he, him mm-hmm. and his wife feed the football mm-hmm. team, and he had me come over. He didn't even tell them well who I was or what. And he, I, he said, I just want you to share your story with him. So it was just different ways of, uh, mm-hmm. of communicating the gospel. And it's kind of fun sitting there with like 15 guys, you know, and they're all bigger than me. And they're all high schoolers, you know, and mm-hmm. they're, they're eating spaghetti. And I'm, 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 I'm going to break into this and say, hey, guys, yeah, um, do you know who I am? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, and they're like, no. And so you get a chance to share the gospel with them. Mm-hmm. Unshackled. Yeah. Man, <laughs> everything about this is just like. Yeah. And uh, Greg Glory and his wife, Kathy, they were, uh, I got a chance to meet them here in Arlington. Mm-hmm. And we shared the story with them, and and they said, "Oh, you guys got to you guys got to write a book." Yeah. And it happened my editor Darren Darren Shaw was in town, and I was with the Vineyards and all that. And we said, "Well, we wrote a book, hmm. but we didn't have a title." And uh, we were we're looking, and every you know we had all kinds of good ideas, but uh, nothing was landing. And mm-hmm. and uh, um, Kathy said, uh, "What was that they, they said in court? Unshackled." Mm-hmm. Unshackled, absolutely. So we it's all kind of looked. We all looked at each other like, okay, and that's that's where the so um, uh, Greg Laurie's wife and them they they were like, yeah, that's and it, so and it that's speaks where more. It speaks more to just obviously unshackle him from 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 prison, but also right. the things that just hold people back. Exactly. So I was going to ask you the first yeah. question that I thought about when, we, when he told me he was interviewing you was at what point did you actually feel unshackled like was it when they took the shackles off you was it when you exited out of there was it like a year later what moment did you actually feel free from the prison system just oh yeah yeah from like they're like you're you're no longer attached to that because i know being in that long you become institutionalized yeah. you become you get um, stuck in a, a place yeah i i would say it was it was it was it was a done deal when i walked out mm-hmm. i knew i was i was never you're free man yeah i knew i was a free man physically uh, it took. Um, I, I went through um, survivor's guilt. I guess it's called because mm-hmm. um, you're institutionalized. I felt bad because my friends, for 35 years, were still there. Mm-hmm. And I was at a prayer meeting one day, and, and, a, and this uh, lady said, "Hey, I want to pray for you." And she laid hands on me, and she said, "God said, release the guilt of being out. Your your brothers are okay." Mm-hmm. It was like I was like. How did you know? You know, so the Holy Spirit revealed that I was walking around feeling not guilty, but I felt bad that they were still there and I was out. I was enjoying. I was, you know, so I, it, 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 I think it's less and less. But I think the first year, everything was so new to me. Every everywhere I went, you know, I was I was working for James Lozano at the time. We were doing some roofing and. Before I was doing what I'm doing now with the babes, chicken dinner house, and being a pastor, I said, and everything was brand new. And he would look at me, and said, "This is the first time you did this, huh? This is the first time you voted, huh?" I said, "Yeah." So it was all these first in the first mm-hmm. year or so. So mm-hmm. that was kind of cool to to do. But I I knew when I left, it was it was done. But um, um, I just enjoyed everything what God was doing, and so I never looked back. I mean, my future was ahead of me, mm-hmm. and so mm-hmm. awesome. Yeah. Well, your, your your story is incredible. More people are going to hear it. I I, I believe this is just the beginning for yeah, you. Um, I believe God just uh, in his sovereignty, in yeah. his plan, but for such a time as this, I think it's like you, you're about ready to unleash it. There's a couple of things I just wanted to wrap, wrap this up, but um, I'm thinking of the scripture uh, that comes out of Matthew 25. Um, it's this whole... Uh, parable of Jesus, the sheep and the goats, and he's dividing this and that. But there's a there's a scripture that we've all heard there in Matthew 25, 34. It says, then the king will say to those on his right, come, you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. 
Mm-hmm. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. Mm. Mm. And then later on, as much as you've done unto these, you've done it unto me. And I think about two things. I think about, really, I think about Pastor Larry and his, if it weren't for people um, that went into the prison system and had a heart to go yeah. after that. And some people, I think, uh, I've been into s- several myself with my dad. My dad would always pull me into him. I've been like Walla Walla State Penitentiary, Rikers mm-hmm. Island, different things like that. And he, he would go in and my testimony has nothing to do with, with these people, but we'd be with the lifers same, you know, yeah. and I, I saw a lot of joy on lifers. A lot of them would just like come in like, the, man, these people are, some of them are more happy than the people outside of the, the prison system, you know? And I would listen to my dad preach to these guys and, and, and I would just get up and sing. I remember he would, he would, he put me and stand me up on a cafeteria table and just sing as guys are braiding each other's hair in the back, you know, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and going, like, you know, and, and, and I have, I have memories of that. And, and, and everybody that my dad would bring that wouldn't come from a lifestyle of that, but would go to the prison, they would get hooked on going to the prison because I always talk about where is Jesus? Where's the presence of the Lord? You know, we seek it when we worship, we seek it when we go to church, we seek it in all these these religious things, but Jesus himself, where is Jesus? Mm-hmm. He's with the poor, he's with the, with the unclothed, broken he's, hearted. He's with the broken hearted, he's with those in prison, he's with the, you know, if you want to get near to Jesus, yeah. go to those places. <laughs> yeah. You know what I'm True. saying? Yeah. The the uh, I remember going into um Rikers Island. It's like the, one of the main joints in New York. Uh, city, mm-hmm. New York State, and 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 it's surrounded by the water or the river. And I remember going in, and I and and some people may be listening to this, thinking, "Well, man, I can't go into the prison system because I'm not right with the Lord, or I'm not like good enough. I'm, I don't have things together." Listen, first of all, it's not about you. Yeah. It's about when you yeah. step out of yourself and you go. And offer yourself. God is just looking for you. He's looking for your vessel, your willingness. Just like Gene stepped out, and and they they got uh, pest, kept pestering him. You know, hey, are you ready to make a commitment? Mm-hmm. Are you ready to make a commitment? And finally, he had to get half Nelson from behind by <laughs> tomorrow, the side. Tomorrow, <laughs> tomorrow, tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, but but the thing is, is that it, it, when you step out of your uncertainty. And you realize, oh man, my righteousness is as filthy rags. It's really ultimately, I, it's about Jesus. He's just looking for my willing heart, you know. And and if you learn anything today uh, from Gene, learn from from the persistence and his 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 heart that just said, God, I give you thanks and everything. And, and realizing where his ultimate freedom came from was was. I mean, it was a, an effort of him going after it, but really, ultimately, it was not just striving. It was when God said, I'm going to set you free, and, and, and you're right. not having anything to do about it. Yeah. You know? So when I think about this, and I think about me going into things like Rikers Island, this is years ago, I walked in, and there were those bubble tents, like those, uh, those, those kind of dome-shaped ones mm-hmm. that were kind of like bubbly. Mm-hmm. And they said, no, you can't touch any of the inmates. You know, I told my dad, make sure it was me and a couple other guys. And this is all the, the lifer guys, and and he said, uh, of course, my dad preaches and gets all worked up, and he ends up laying hands on people, yeah. you know. And, and and I think the guards were letting it go, and so I wasn't living uh, caught up in sin myself, you know. Even though I was a Christian, married, I just wasn't living right. Mm-hmm. And my dad took me anyways. I went into that prison, and my <clears throat> my father looked at me in the back during the altar call, and he says, he gives me the motion like, come here. Yeah. Points at a guy like. Pray for this guy right here. So I mosey on up, you know, like, oh, man, all right. My dad's making me do this. And I remember there was an African-American guy, tall, skinny guy. Mm-hmm. And all I did was I just laid my hands on him. And now you got to think, I'm not, I don't feel that I'm right with the right, Lord. Right. But I lay my hands on the guy. The guy, boom, went down like if, like if, like if lightning hit him, you know, mm. on his back. Wasn't faking it one bit, just blah, 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 just tongues and tears mm. immediately came down from I looked at my dad, and he looked at me, and he's like, whoa. <laughs> like he got <laughs> that pumped him up. <clears throat> pumped him up. Yeah. And I realized, if you're out, guys, if you're listening out there, stop waiting to be used yeah. by God. Uh, stop amen. stop sitting there and thinking, well, mm. I have to. No, it's, it's your willingness to just step forward. And in your faith, you're, you're, you're pleasing God. 
I, I want to say one last thing. Gene, you, you said something. I love this. I love this, what you said. You said you, you used to love going into your cell in the first nine years mm. of your, of your uh, sentence. sentence, and you liked yeah. to make it dark. And that was your place of kind of like just checking out and yeah. coping with what you did. And then, then on that final uh, that, that hearing that you got re- denied on at 35 years mm-hmm. into your, your, your system, yeah. you go right back to the same cell and God says, give me thanks. Yeah. Yeah. And you use that same place. It's like the same place that God has you in. You think, oh, I got to get taken. No, it's just a change of heart. Yeah, it's, a it's, change a of heart. Cha- it's a change of where you're at yeah. that makes you feel like... You became the light in the darkness. Yeah. That's Man, your that's yeah. what God... My father would always say... Jesus delights coming in behind locked doors. Mm. And he used to say, when all hope is gone, <clears throat> that's when Jesus comes. Mm. Yeah. And for you, literally. Mm. When you're flat on your back. Man. Looking up is, is like There's no, no better place to be viewing is you're down and, about, down and out on a hard floor of a prison cell. There's a way, you know, like I, I get letters all the time. I get emails and people say, hey, my son, my grandson's in prison. Look, I, I want to be sympathetic, you know, but I, in my heart, I'm like, good. Maybe, maybe he'll come to know the Lord. Mm-hmm. You know, and I, I, I don't know whether he's guilty or not, but I, I don't want to be that sensitive. I don't say that. Yeah, yeah. But unless we get into a conversation, I'm like, hey. And I, I'll tell him, you know, it's good. Leave him there. Don't bail him out, you know. And, in fact, I, I, had a, I was, I, I, we, were, we were visiting a man in Amarillo, and we went back, and he just got there. He was, he was in assault. Um, a, a violent assault, mm. and uh, he was facing big time. And everybody was gathering the money to bail him out. And that night, I had a dream, and the Lord said, if they bail him out, they're going to abort. He said, he, God says, they're going to abort my plan for his life. Mm. And I wow. thought, you know how abortion is. You, you, you kill the child. You kill the potential and everything in the child. And uh, I, that, that next morning, I had to speak up and say, hey, guys, um, mm-hmm. In here, but God already spoke to them. But but when I, I said, I said, God said, you're going to abort, if you get this guy out of prison, you're going to abort the plan for his life. And they, they looked at me and I thought, man, they're going to kill me, you know? <laughs> and they said, we heard the same thing. We're not going to bail him out. Mm. Well, he, he went on to get saved. Man. He, went got, he was born again. He spent like about eight years in prison. That's some deep wisdom. So, That's some deep wisdom. But I, was, I was like, oh, Lord. <laughs> yeah. You know what this whole thing, Rory, can I tell you uh, a story? You can, you can leave this in or not. <laughs> Did I ever tell you about the time a bounty hunter was looking for me? Oh, <laughs> my yeah. God. This is real quick. It's this short. <laughs> yeah, it's funny. So uh, me and my dad was at home, uh, and this guy knocks at the door. He's in a charger, a black charger, and he's like the most like northern, and I'm looking for Joshua Stewart, like real uh, oh. like Italian-toned. And he, uh, I'm just like, my dad was like, Josh, somebody at the door looking for you. Okay. Mm. And then he was like, I was like, where is he? He's like, he didn't live in my I'm like, you let him in the house? <laughs> <laughs> and he was like, he's like, yeah, I'm a bounty hunter, man. You're Joshua Stewart. I'm like, yeah, what do you need? He was like, <laughs> he was like, do you know this guy? Is this your phone number? I'm like, yeah. He's like, this is where you live. Yeah. This your car? Like all my info. And I'm like, what do you want? So he asked me about this guy, shows a picture, this guy is wanted and all stuff like that. I'm like, brother, I don't know that man. I'm sorry about this man, but I don't know who this man is. I knew nothing about the guy. I didn't know what he looked. I didn't even know. I've never seen this man in my life. And he got all these questions and I asked all these questions and stuff. And then he was like, all right, well, I'll, I'll be around. And, I, and if I need any more info, I'll know, I know where to find you. And I was just like, oh my I'm, I'm thinking maybe, you know, back in my childhood days, me doing my being a roughneck and caught up with me from Louisiana. I'm like, oh, they didn't found me. But so he leaves and I have his card. And me and my dad going back and forth. I'm like, man, you, you, you let him in the house. Man, you could have locked the door or something. She was like, man, I didn't know. So we got past that. And then I get his card and I look him up online. This is where it gets even crazier. Look him up online. And I, I did see he was a police officer or something like that. But then I click on the link and it says that he played a police officer in a diehard movie. No. And I'm like, is 
So was he actually <laughs> looking for? I, I never heard from him ever again. So I didn't, I, never, I didn't know if he was actually looking for me or researching a role. So I was just like, what in the world? That was a, one of the crazy. Yeah. That's, that's what I thought about oh, all yesterday. So I, I guess he was a police officer at one point, And then he was like, they maybe needed real officers for the movie or something. He went into the full role to, to do so the I, research and he chose just, you. Yeah, it's just like, all right, I'm just going to find somebody on Facebook. Where's the Dragon Ball? Yeah, doors, right. been- <laughs> Who's morphing time? <laughs> I'm morphing time. And I've never seen or heard from this man ever again. Oh, and that's my how you- oh, gosh. Wow. That's the- almost as hardcore as Gene's story. Yeah. Basically. Uh, it's, 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 pretty, it's, pretty, it's pretty similar. <laughs> I, I would have been scared too. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, uh, oh, my gosh. Well, we're going to wrap this thing up. So, Gene, if there's anybody out there listening that maybe has a loved one uh, behind bars or just anybody that's listening to this that, yeah. that, that, you can speak to just last words that you can just yeah. whatever God said on your heart. I just say if if there's someone there, um, you know, depending on wh- what's going on in their life, you know, you absolutely pray for them and and pray. Jesus, release your will in their life. Jesus, capture the their their heart for you. Uh, don't don't enable them. Don't try to rescue them. Let Jesus be the savior of the life. They they got to come to know the Lord. Mm-hmm. And and I always yeah. say, you know, a man uh, without Christ is out of control. So I I say pray for them and and let the Holy Spirit let the Lord begin to work in his life. Don't come and try to rescue them right away. Mm-hmm. He'll be there for them, love them, care for them. Mm-hmm. You know, come alongside them, but be careful about rescuing them. Let the Lord rescue them. Lord rescue. Man, that's good stuff, dude. Well, man, this has been one of the best podcasts. Definitely. Thank you for joining us. You are welcome. My and pleasure. We laughed. We cried. Come on. Check it out. So listen up. Uh, <laughs> please subscribe to this podcast. Show us some love. Share it on social. If you have any questions, make sure to email podcast Uh-oh. at dose or the ghost. Dose of the Ghost. Dose of the Ghost. Dot com. Hit Don't us up on Patreon. Patreon. Go get this Unshackled book. Unshackled. Gene McGuire. Check it out. We'll see you later. Peace. Peace.